Bienvenue à Loathsome Things, un podcast des films d'horreur. Yeah. Oh, fuck yeah. Uh, my name is John, and with me, as always, is my co-host Josh. Uh, for those of you who do not speak French, uh, welcome to Loathsome Things, a podcast, a horror movie podcast. Uh, Josh, how, how are you doing, sir? We oui, I do quite well. <laughs> I'm doing a fan. <laughs> I like the idea that Marina Devan was like, mm, one day I hope two white American dudes will talk about my movie. <laughs> I hope that two white American dudes can take all of the laugh from my movie. <laughs> uh, I'm doing good. I am enjoying life or something. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's really great. Current events. Current events are good. Mm. Um, uh, and I'm I'm looking forward to talking about simpler times, like the year 2002, <laughs> when everything was better. <laughs> when life was better. <laughs> How about yourself, John? How are you? I, I'm doing well. Um, I also am uh, looking forward to discussing things in 2002. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's about it. Nothing too exciting going on. Just yeah, that's it. Yeah. The stuff. So so John, I, I mentioned Marina mm -hmm. Marina Devan. Mm -hmm. uh, what what Marina Devan film are we you know gonna be discussing on this episode where people already clicked on the thing and it showed the title of it already? Yeah, let me. Um, I don't want to you know spoiler alert, but here comes yeah. the title of the movie that you read when you clicked on this podcast. Uh, yeah. The movie's called Doma Po, uh, yeah. which means in my skin. And uh, it was written, directed, starring uh, Marina Devon, Devan, we'll say Devan. And yeah. uh, she, uh, yeah, she made this delightful little uh, extreme body horror movie that uh, is kind of been lumped in with the whole new French extremity thing. But I think it was just kind of its own thing, you know, that she, she would have, could have made it any era that, just, that anyone would have been willing to pay for it. It just happened to be then. I mean, if you're going to call a movement a new French extremity, this is pretty much the one for it, since it is primarily about uh, French extremities. Yeah. 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 The, uh, the, the French have an interesting relationship with the human body, apparently, uh, uh -huh. because there's this movie, there's a movie called Raw from 2000, uh, what was it, 6 or 16? 16. 16. Uh, <laughs> And, yeah, one uh, of those. Yeah, there's uh, the one where the uh, the the pregnant woman is basically being besieged by the crazy lady that wants her baby. Uh, you know, all pretty extreme stuff. Uh, I mean, we we make those kind of movies here too. But y if you consider that the French film industry is nowhere near the size of the American film industry, then the percentage of body horror films being produced over there might be a little high. But yeah. Um, Anyways, but yeah, I, I, I do want to say, like, up front that um, if, if the subject of self-harm is something that makes you uncomfortable or, you know, is a trigger for you, this is definitely not the movie for you. Um, you if you uh, heard our last episode, then you knew that we were going to cover this movie. But if not, and you're like, well, maybe I'll pause and just go watch that real quick. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we probably we probably need to start thinking about this uh, for like announcing the next movie because it's like yeah, go ahead and watch da Dan's Mapu before <laughs> uh, before our next episode. Then we're like, oh, by the way, um... uh, retroactively. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we kicked it off with Wake and Fright, and it was like yeah, yeah. So yeah, if you want to if you want to watch the next movie before uh, uh, before we cover it, go watch Wake and Fright, and then oh, by the way. <laughs> By the way, if you happen to have not seen Wicked Fright yet, <laughs> yeah. do you like kangaroos or your skin? Well, <laughs> otherwise, if you've already seen it because of our recommendation, a thousand pardons. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, though. It's good. Uh, oh. This... So this one, uh, it's Marina Devan. Uh, she's directed other horror things. Dark Touch is one of her more recent ones. Mm -hmm. But you can definitely see like a theme if you look at her movies. Like her most recent movie that she did directed, which was ten years ago, is 
uh, my my nudity means nothing, mm. which is a autobiographical documentary about her own movie making career and depictions of her body in the movies that she directed. So if you get the impression that maybe this lady really thinks that she is interesting, you might be right. <laughs> She she is interesting uh, to me anyway. Um, she's a, she's an odd woman. I mean, she has she's attractive but strange looking at the same time. I guess you could say. Um, yeah. I, I first found out about her, and I think I mentioned it last time. Was uh, I first found out about her from a short film uh, that I saw on cable a million years ago uh, called See the Sea, and uh, it was uh, about an hour long. And it was uh, extremely disturbing, and she's the disturbing part for most. Yeah, of it. and uh, it's great. I mean, I that movie is, it's it's an hour of just pure punch you right in the gut. Um, yeah, really effective. Yeah, <laughs> that ending, that ending is real, really intense for a movie that's not really intense. The movie is very mm-hmm. well. I mean, uh, it's it, you know th- in this movie too it's very french it's very mm-hmm. ennui mm-hmm. and then it's like also fuck you and kicks you in the nuts <laughs> yeah, yeah that's right <laughs> she's she kind of has a similar appearance to a, another french actress named beatrice Dahl, who i also mentioned last time but uh she was the uh woman that plays like the crazy person that's stalking the pregnant woman in that other film i think it's called they call it inside, I think, in English. I forget. I think that's what it was called. Um, and uh, they kind of have a similar look. Like Beatrice Dahl has a gap between her two front teeth, but she's mm-hmm. she is strikingly beautiful. Um, whereas this this woman has more kind of a unique kind of different look, you know. But they they have a similar appearance, and they kind of play similar like really intense female roles. <laughs> I say the self indulgent bit because like we watch this movie and. I'd say she is what the camera is focused mm. on about 90%. Yeah. I think that that's a, that's a conservative estimate that about mm-hmm. 90% of the time the camera is just fixated on her. Yeah. Um, but it's for a purpose and it's very effective. That's true. Yeah. I, I guess I never really thought about it, but you're right. It, 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 she's, she is essentially the center of every shot and every scene you don't see anything from anyone else's point of view. The, the whole thing might as well just be from in her mind, you know? Yeah. Which is yeah. great. Every every once in a while we'll trail off like, oh, look, there's a there's that thing's happening over there. But but most of the time, if, if another person is talking, we're not really looking at them talk. We're looking at them talk to her. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, it's, and it's very interesting. Yeah, fortunately, she has a face that, you know, is interesting to look at, because otherwise this movie would be really boring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, she has a face made for smoking cigarettes. Yes, she does. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. She she plays Esther, and uh, the, an actor named Laurent Lucas. Laurent Lucas plays her boyfriend, Vincent. Um, he was also in the film Raw, and he was also in another kind of really small indie uh kind of thriller horror film called alleluia and then yeah. i guess the only other actress of actor of note is the actress uh, leah drucker who plays her friend sandrine and uh, nothing passive aggressive happens between the two of them um no she's been in a lot of things yeah, these are these actors have, are very prolific particularly uh the you know the guy that plays her boyfriend and leah drucker but uh leah drucker wasn't really in anything that i recognized uh i didn't dig too deep into her career because i didn't like her character <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you're not wrong <laughs> but i mean you know to to the actor's credit she did a great job yeah yeah there's also in here is a uh, mark rufo who plays Henri, and mm. he is also um mostly just in a whole bunch of french things yeah is he the one that plays her boss yeah 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 yeah, that, that douche. That guy's a t- that guy's a twat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be fair, he had a good point. He was like, "Wow, that was a uh, you were real disappointing." <laughs> That's the f- yeah. It's, it's aside from her boyfriend, who really is just has a tendency to overreact to everything. But I mean, at the same time, given the situation, I guess anybody would. 
But uh, really, the reactions to the things she does are pretty natural. I mean, you know, if your best friend was, well, we'll get into it. But, you know, you yeah. you would be reacting, you know, you'd be concerned, too. Like, maybe I'll just take these nail clippers and this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and especially it's 2002, maybe, you know, education on the topics wasn't as good in France back then. I don't know how education is in France. I assume better. Um, <laughs> better than this, better than this yeah. country. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, it's a, it's a whole thing. And also this movie, this movie kind of defies uh, straightforward interpretation. It's yeah. not really one where at the end of the movie you're like ah oh, yes uh indisputable what this movie was about like there's there's a lot of room for interpretation and i i think there's probably like no one interpretation that covers it like covers all the bases it's mm-hmm. very much i think uh from marina de van's mind it was you know she was the not just the director and star but also the writer on this so it's just she was pouring a whole lot of herself into this project and and it shows yeah yeah for sure yeah i mean this it, most of the things that happen in the film except for one part are things that you know could could happen in real life there's one part that you know it's like okay this is i guess her imagination but you know maybe it isn't who knows what the world is that they inhabit in this film <laughs> yeah that's true. All right. Uh, anything else we need to get to before moving moving into that thing? I can't think of anything. You? No, I'm good. I'll kick us off. Uh, Esther, the person we've been talking about, played by Marina Devan. Devan. Um, oh, dance my poo. <laughs> Esther is an agency analyst, I guess, or something. Uh, Her unemployed boyfriend, Vincent, wants to move away from the city. This is most of what he talks about. He wants to buy an old house and renovate it somewhere outside of the city. And she's like, yeah, but you don't have a job, you piece of shit. She doesn't say this, of course. It's all very French. Um, She goes to a work party, and while outside doing absolutely nothing, she slips on some construction equipment and tears her (laughs) frock i don't know um uh her protective friend sandrine cock blocks her from the boss guy at the party it's very not tense but there is some sort of electricity there uh and when she goes to the bathroom she realizes that she sliced her leg up when she fell and there's you know like there's blood all over her dress and all over the floor. There's a whole thing about it. She ends up going to a sexy doctor who tells her that it's not normal to get this caught up, cut up and not feel it. She's like, yeah, I didn't feel it later. Now it hurts, of course. And he's like, huh, that's weird. Um, he he says that you could get a skin graft because if, if you don't, it's going, like, you'll be fine, but it's going to grow back all lumpy and ugly and gross. And she was like, but is it necessary? He's like, no, it's not necessary. And she's like, oh, okay, well, then I'm not going to do it. (laughs) Great. Uh, She starts developing a fascination with the loose skin. We see her in the bathtub, and she's just, like, tugging on her groin skin to see how much extra (laughs) is available to her. Uh, um, And she starts playing with the skin around her wound. Um, Vincent is weirded out by all of this. Esther deflects and says she doesn't want to talk about it and they then kiss in the frenchest way possible for a long time while having a conversation the next day her boss compliments her excellent work on a piece of analysis that she did and while then she goes back to work she immediately has trouble focusing and goes to a back room at the office pulls down her pants around her ankles pops a squat and starts to slowly and squishily move around her hand below the screen and it's like is she masturbating but then no we see actually that she is sensually enjoying peeling off a chunk of her wound skin (laughs) my god it's it's amazing she she has some sort of implement that she's found i don't know if it's like a staple remover or it's something horrible and and this is the point in the film where it dawns on me that the um like I watched it on my laptop with headphones, and the the sound in this movie is so much a part. It's like an it's like a character in the just endless like click. Yeah, 
Oh, yeah. Just constant clicking metal sounds, skin tearing sounds, uh, weird little vocalizations that she makes. Uh, it's 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 hard to watch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What well, once you tune into it, it's like, oh god, wow. Okay. Yeah, and then there's there's <laughs> scenes where it's used to really interesting effect, um, which reminds me. Yeah, we'll get to that later. That that there's a camera thing that she uses that ties back to the credits. But anyways, back at her office, um, she she goes to the bathroom and there's a soap dish in the bathroom with what looks like blood at the underneath the soap, which I'm I don't know. That's maybe it's hers. Um, so she yeah. sticks her finger in it and, you know, it's like, oh God. And she's like, mm, numbers. And then, <laughs> ooh, soap blood. So she, she heads back out. She's, she's like kind of badgering Sandrine, her friend to go get some coffee, but she's all butt hurt because Esther is, um, you know, basically motivated to do what Sandrine wants to be able to do, which is aggressively push for her own career advancement. Um, so Sandrine's just kind of a pain in the ass. So, True. so then Esther just just kind of casually confesses that, hey, you know, I just earlier I went to the back and I was like ripping open my my wounds. <laughs> yeah, I was like just cutting like I found this thing and I was just like tearing my wounds open. And her friend is like, oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I'm just kind of bored. I want to get coffee. Earlier, I went to the bathroom and I cut myself. <laughs> She's like, why? Did, why did you do that? She's like, oh, well, I mean, it's I, I liked it. I enjoyed it. <laughs> it's like, oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> then she brags, Esther brags a little bit about her great performance, how the boss likes the paper she wrote or whatever it is. Uh, Sandrine convinces her that, you know, uh, why don't you stay over at my place tonight? And... Um, you know, kind of wants to keep an eye on her. She's still kind of trying to be a friend. Um, mm-hmm. So they go to her house, uh, or her, her apartment, whatever. Uh, Esther takes a shower. We get a full frontal nudity shot because, you know, France. And then yeah. um, Sandrine enters the bathroom, which originally had the door locked, and she's that's she's bothered about that. She sees uh, Esther's leg, freaks out even more because she realizes that her leg looks way worse than she probably imagined. Um and she just casually, while she's talking to her, is removing all the sharp implements. Like, oh, yeah, that's <laughs> hmm, interesting. I'll just take this. Oh. Yeah. The- what is that, hair trimmers? I'll grab those. And uh, <laughs> it's pretty funny. Uh, she's pretty much traumatized at this point, her friend. Not her, but her friend. Um, over dinner, her friend starts to express some concern, and Esther just kind of blows it off. And there's a scene where, and there's a line where like Sandrine says, I mean, you know, I know you, but it looks sick to an outsider. <laughs> so yeah, it looks sick to her too, yeah. clearly. Um, yeah, she tries. She tries to uh, talk her later on. She tries to talk her in. Uh, Sandrine tries to talk Esther into not bringing up the promotion because they're at some party event. These people apparently they just have parties in the middle of the day during the work day, whatever France. So. Um, yeah, she's like, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't bring it up. I mean, it's, you know, it's probably not a good idea, which, you know, of course she at the pool gig, she immediately brings it up and gets the job. The the project manager job, which is the one that Sandrine has been eyeballing since, you know, 100 years ago when she got hired. So now she's <laughs> she's super jealous and yeah, gives her like the the most backhanded like passive aggressive congratulations. In the meantime, a bunch of dudes jump out of the pool oh. and just basically molest Esther in front of everybody and yeah, pull her pants down and her friend just sits there and does nothing. Nobody does anything. And then like the one guy, they, li- they, they let her go. She's laying on the ground in like pool water, her pants down, her shirt pulled up, you know, and the guy's like, oh, sorry, I guess we got a little out of hand. <laughs> what the fuck was that? I have no idea. Every time I watch that movie, because it happens so early in the movie yeah. that so much stuff happens after it, I forget every time that that happened. And then when I watched it again, I'm like, yeah, what the fuck is this? They, they, three guys pick her up and hold her over their heads and like start taking her clothes off. She was like, no, I can't get into the pool. I don't have a swimsuit. And they're like, <laughs> it doesn't matter. And then one of the dudes notices that her leg is bleeding and he's like, guys, stop. Stop and like that's it. Oh, oh yeah, no, sorry, we didn't mean to uh, make your leg start bleeding horrifically. 
<laughs> Apparently, it's perfectly normal to molest people at work. So, all français. Jesus Christ, that that was really strange. So, uh, yeah, and she's you can see their, her leg is bleeding through the pants. Uh, she's and she starts getting super anxious and bolts out of there. Uh, she goes out to her car, opens the trunk, and we see. All these gross, dirty, like, rusty tools and blood stains in the trunk. And just, like, she's got her mullet, like, her maligning kit that she brings with her, apparently. And she kind of, she kind of horns out a little bit over the tools, kind (laughs) of, and then, who textures? Changes her pants and goes back to the party. Uh, Later on, she's with her boyfriend, Vincent, and, uh, She's kind of talking shit about her friend or ex-friend or whatever she is. And uh, Vincent's pretty much predisposed. He cannot hang with the injury situation on her leg. And be- to show how concerned he is, he acts like a complete asshole. <laughs> He's aggressive with her and rude and mean. And then when she gets hurt, then he gives her this trashy apology. I'm sorry. I guess that I might have overreacted. You, know, you think? Uh, yeah. yeah, he's a dick. And then yeah. the next morning, she she wakes up. Her arm is asleep, apparently. So she's kind of playing with it. Then he sits up. He didn't even know he was next to her. And then he's, like, massaging her hand. And then it looks like they might, you know, start to fuck. And then yeah. back to the office, uh, Esther has a, a big meeting uh, with these two marketing people from a different company that they're, they're clients or whatever. They're, they have a big job with these people. Esther impresses them with her knowledge and the fact that she's, I lived in the Middle East and uh, ends up getting a really important role in this business deal. Her boss is really, you know, cause she's nailing it. Um, yeah. Then Sandrine uh, uh, runs across her in the hallway and tries to eat crow with this bullshit joke about her ruined pants. Hey, when are you going to, what are you going to do about my pants? They're 900 francs. <laughs> no, no, they're only 90. Oh, <laughs> uh, the worst, Sandrine. Get out of here. Uh, and Esther just is like a too super cold bitch to her. It's great. Uh, <laughs> She's like, I'll leave a check with the lady outside. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Uh, she's at home again later now after work. She's cleaning her legs. She's talking to her boyfriend about this new apartment that he can't help pay for. And he <laughs> he uh, freaks out because he sees a red stain on her palm and grabs her hand, you know, like a total dick. What is this? Oh, it's just ink or something. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the next night, we have the the infamous business dinner where her and her boss meet these same two folks that they had a meeting with in the office. Uh, she, the guy, the guy from the other, like the business associates or the clients or whatever, uh, offers her wine, which she tries to turn down, but he's kind of pushy with it. So in re- response to that, she basically just starts chugging wine. Um, she's clearly nervous. She's anxious. And she's using the wine as a, you know, as a way to kind of escape that probably and to, and hoping that she won't have a cutting incident. Um, yeah. But then we see that as these people are talking, and boy, do they talk a lot, her Jesus. her hand decides to start playing with her food, a la, uh, a la Evil Dead. And yeah. <laughs> nobody seems to really notice. And then um, all of a sudden she looks down and her arm is cut off at the forearm. Like, it's, it's not even cut off, it's just separated. It's, yeah. it's not even bloody or anything. It's just a big prosthetic. I mean, it's pretty obvious. Sitting on the yeah. table with, you know, and she's kind of like, oh, well, I just better better try and reattach that. <laughs> <laughs> so she puts it back on and then um, takes a steak knife under the table and is like jabbing it into her arm and cutting and tearing and there's blood everywhere and then... Her napkin falls on the ground, and she doesn't want to pick it up because the guy next to her is going to see. So there's this weird, like, uncomfortable moment. So then she puts her coat on, and, you know, now she's got everyone's attention because she's acting really weird. And she yeah. she puts her coat on to cover the, you know, the situation with her arm and says something like, Whew, huh, it's really cold in here, isn't it? Well, okay, I'm going to the bathroom. <laughs> awesome yeah so so she gets up and leaves she instead of going to the bathroom she goes to like i guess it's france so they have like a wine cellar or something that looks like a basement in a castle (laughs) yeah it's awesome 
Um, she goes back there to just, you know, shove a knife into her arm a bolt whole bunch and, and, you know, relieve the pressure. But then while she's back there, she hears a waiter come in. So she drops the knife and scampers and hides behind a shelf. And the, the waiter comes in looking for something, sees the knife on the ground, sees blood everywhere, and is like, oh, shit, and runs out. And so then she has to, like, slink out and try to not get noticed. But she cut her arm enough that she was able to, like, get what she needed from the situation. And so she walks back to the table, and she looks like she is floating on a cloud of bliss. She is just obviously out of it. And they're like, oh, should we order dessert? And everyone's like looking at her and they're like no i think we need to go home <laughs> i think your associate is in a k-hole <laughs> <laughs> jesus uh, so um she makes her uh she, after dinner she makes her way to a hotel that she saw through the window uh and then just hunkers down in the hallway in the middle of a dingy hallway and starts carving on her arm and and just just licking it, essentially gnawing on it, and then you know, drinking the blood a little bit, and then she gets bored with that and is like, ooh, I do have a whole other leg that hasn't been scoured. <laughs> so she rips open her pant and just starts chugging away at that leg with the knife. <laughs> and then she like get does a does a yoga pose where she's got her leg up over her face and is letting the blood drip down onto her face and is just rubbing it into her pores and drinking it and really, really having a great time. <laughs> yeah. uh, this this is the scene I want. It's, it's like a four minute long scene. This is the scene that I watched uh. thinking that it was an entire horror <laughs> short film. And, I, and, and Chad was like, yeah, I want to cover that. And I was like, well, I don't know how we'd stretch that into an hour, but let's try. I counted the serrations on her blade. <laughs> yeah, and uh, at, at the end of it, so uh, she, she after all that, she ends up with this little, like, flap of skin uh -huh. at the end, and she's just, like, playing with it, and, and have, like, mm, I, uh, this is my favorite part of the whole experience. And then on her way home, she crashes her car into the woods, yeah. apparently, like, drives it off the side of the road into the woods. Intentionally. Yeah, intentionally. Uh, we don't even see that happen. It's just the car is now crashed in the woods. She's in the back of an ambulance. Vincent shows up, and he's like, hey, are you okay? And she's like, Oh, yeah, I'm fine. Here, let me recite for you this very state fake story <laughs> I made up about how the street signs got confusing and I had too much wine. It's such bullshit. <laughs> it is the most bullshit thing ever. Vincent notices the cuts on her leg and he's like, ooh, these are almost in the exact same spot as on your other leg. And he's like, oh, you must have laid in the broken glass for a long time i'm guessing based on the pattern of these cuts and then he starts like fingering the cuts and stuff like oh dude what are you doing now that's weird okay i know i thought i thought he was gonna get turned on to it next or something yeah but then no it doesn't happen she blames it on the drinking he's like oh okay that's fine then you just won't drink anymore it's good uh, yeah. And then he moves past it and just starts talking about the house that he wants to renovate some more. Like, it's nah, that's over. He was like, oh, people get confused. People get burned out. It's fine. <laughs> the next morning, she goes into work. She apologizes to her boss for being shitty at their business dinner. He says that she was embarrassing and that if it happens again, she'll either be fired or demoted. But that also the like last th piece of work that she turned in was really good. So overall, she's better <laughs> off than she was yesterday or something yeah. yeah what did he say she's got credits or something still yeah yeah so you're in credit it's like oh thank you france okay um <laughs> thank you for <laughs> on her way to to visit the house with uh, the the place that her boyfriend wants to renovate she goes to get cash from an atm but she gets distracted because in her wallet is a little sachet full of her skin clippings and uh, she, instead of putting in her ATM card and punching in the numbers, she just pulls that out and is just like, just, just 
t- playing with the little bits of skin, just touching them and looking down at them and smiling, but then noticing that something is wrong and we don't we can't figure out what's wrong yet. We just can see on her face that something's wrong and she starts crying and we're like, "Oh, she must realize, hey, this is really fucked up of me." I don't know if that's going to end up to be what it is, but she starts crying and he's like, "Hey, what's the matter?" And she's like, Baby, "I can't remember my pin number." <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, it's fine." And he punches in her pin number and gets the cash out and he's like, eh, "I'm not paying attention to this anymore." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that scene is over. That night, Vincent is pissed off. He says that she's obviously hiding something from him and that he doesn't know her anymore. She's like, of course you know me. And he that this is whatever. He's like, oh, yeah, people just get burnt out. It's whatever. He's he's alternates between being really aggressive about it and then just dismissive of the whole situation. He's really existing within his own little dream world where he's going to get to renovate a place in the country. The next morning she gets dressed uh, to, for work and he's still asleep in the bed because he is a uh, unemployed guy with more dreams than work skills, I guess. I don't know. Kisses him on the arm and heads out. Yeah, he's a, he's a sack of mailed. <laughs> uh, so uh, Esther heads to a like a like an urban kind of big open grocery store, kind of like a downtown department store or something like that, or a mall maybe. And um, her vision starts to get all wonky, so it's like kind of blurry and weird, and the music's really loud, and the sounds of people walking, like sh- the you know, it sounds like clopping, like people hitting coconuts together to make horse sounds and stuff and yeah it's, it's just yeah exactly fromage oh my god so so she's stumbling through this place and people are kind of walking by like sped up so it looked you know so just to give you an idea that her Anxiety is basically completely out of control at this point. Um, she, I don't know if she's in the same store or whatever, but now she's in a grocery store and she's she buys a bunch of shit, and then we we get kind of like the self harm centerpiece of the movie, which we're, we go back to the way the credits were shot. There's a split screen, and except it was done in like reverse colors, like negative colors. Mm-hmm. Um, for whatever reason, because that's French. In this scene, she's back in that hotel. We've got the split thing. Uh, she's got knives, box cutters, really nice cameras. Uh, I mean, she's ready for a, for a real sesh. Yeah, she's going <laughs> to have a great time. <laughs> this lady knows how to party. <laughs> <laughs> so she's prepping. She's got all her stuff out. She's getting ready for the super cut. And... She starts, you know, <laughs> she starts taking like really high class SLR photos and, you know, just some great sound effects of, of this was the loudest hotel I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. Uh, people clomping around again, uh, going about their day. We've got the split screen still happening. She's hacking away, jabbing, cutting, making a bloody mess. You know, sometimes the, the two shots overlap a little from different angles. It's. You know, it's a little disorienting and, and kind of, you know, pointless, but whatever. And uh, so then the two the two shots kind of almost line up, but they don't. And then we're out of that split screen thing. Now we see her full frame in all her glory. She's wearing like some hose, like some black fishnet hose or something. Uh, one leg is completely taken off of the hose and that's all she's wearing. And she's standing at the door to the hotel, kind of turning, facing us. The camera would be maybe 15 feet away, looking at her. She's covered in head, from head to toe, in blood and wounds. And then she's, now we see her, she's on the ground. And she starts playing this weird, contorted peekaboo game with the camera. (laughs) And her foot. Her foot. She, like, pulls her foot up and is, like, sucking on her foot while looking at us. So you're just like... Wow. Okay. I mean, that's if that's what you want to do, that's yeah. fine. Okay. Yeah. Quentin but, Tarantino loved that scene. <laughs> oh my God. He put this whole movie in the spank bag. <laughs> <laughs> so she she looks as I described it. She looks both trauma traumatized and ecstatic. Practically, if not totally orgasmic, she even makes that 
little squeaky, like, inhale sound. Yeah. Like, she's just about to, you know, just bounce around. So, um, then she, we see a close-up of her face, you know, and she's crying uh, while she gets dangerously close to her eyes and her whatever with the, with this horrible knife, this yeah. big knife. And I was just like, please don't stick it in your eye. Please don't stick it in. And she didn't. No, um, but so close. Like, just uh, right there. Like, like pressing the tip of it into, like, the cheekbone just below her eye. And I'm just like... Uh, Oh my god, actress, actor lady, you're gonna you're gonna do the thing. Like if you slip, oh my god. Yeah, yeah this is not the time for method acting. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, it's very uncomfortable. Um, and she does a great job. I mean, yeah. as as you know, the performance is pretty brave. <laughs> um, so, anyways, then she we she's like now hacking away, kind of can blow the screen or whatever. She's hacking away. She pulls up this big this sheet of like fruit roll up skin that she's cut off of her leg. <laughs> it's just it's so disgusting. <laughs> it's just oh my god, it's all gross and red and bloody and she's just ah, blah, 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 like really into it. <laughs> Having a great time with it. It, it is just she, like a fruit roll up. You're so right. <laughs> like peach she, flavored. <laughs> yes, it's like some off color too. Yeah. She's got these horrible little like wounds around her eye. These little holes. These like like she took a, the tip of a knife and carved little pits out. You know, like when you carve like the try to get the little black thing off of a side of a potato. Yeah, you there just it carve is. That little, she's got those on her face. It's horrible. Yeah, and uh, she looks really bad. And then um, then she goes to a pharmacist <laughs> and gets into. Gets into a casual talk with the pharmacist about how she has, she had a piece of skin removed because there was something wrong with it, and she wants to tan it. <laughs> so he's telling her how to leather her skin by using aluminum chloride or a potassium, whatever yeah. the fuck it is. Aluminum and, and, and potassium, yeah. Just this weird discussion that then you, uh, you press it down real strong and... Uh, and it will be supple and smooth. I mean, of course, there won't be any dyes or anything in it, but you know, it'll be it'll be leather. It'll be great. <laughs> and then he's he like, just oh, happens I... to know that too. Like he's the he's like a Walgreens pharmacist. Like, wow, they are really well trained in France, man. So, so <laughs> you got you got to know all about drugs and tanning. Yeah, <laughs> he's also the village alchemist. Yeah, yeah, no shit. Would you like to turn your skin into gold? So, so she pulls out this bottle. It looks like a makeup bottle or a perfume bottle, and it's it's got her skin in it. And he goes to reach for it, and she kind of recoils. And then he's like, "May I look at it?" And so, so he opens it and takes these tweezers and pulls out this flap of pink skin. And he's like, "Well, it looks fine to me. There doesn't look like there's anything wrong with it." And she's like, "There's something wrong with it." <laughs> He's like, I don't see why you can't leather this, and gives it back to her, and then back to the room where yeah. she's, she's, uh, yeah, oh god. And then okay, so back at the blood barn, we see like all her photos that she's taken because apparently she has a a um, dark room in their room. I don't know where how she got all those photos exposed, but yeah, they're they're there, and she's I mean, she must have taken the film out. So she's got the photos spread out all over like the bedside table, and it's just like this. This ocean of gore. There's blood everywhere. There's bloody photos everywhere. There's bloody, bloody tools. It's disgusting. Uh, her face is a fucking horror show. Like, there's now blood stains to go along with all the cuts. And it looks like she sliced her nostril open a la Chinatown. Yeah. And it's just, it's really uncomfortable looking. And uh, she, she puts her skin <laughs> in the open case jewel case of a fucking cd that's her tanning station and then she wakes up in the morning and checks her skin she's so excited and it just didn't work the tanning did not take now it looks like a piece of like a dog chew it's brown it and hard and dry and she's very upset so she takes it and stuffs it into her bra and then pushes her tit up and kisses it because that's what you do when you can't tan a chunk of your thigh flesh. 
and her her bra is like soaked in like blood and she's got blood stains all over and it looks like real blood like that they used real blood i wouldn't be surprised must have smelled delightful (laughs) and uh (laughs) so then all of a sudden she just gets dressed and bails out and then then she leaves the hotel she grabs all her shit and leaves but then the next shot is her face close up i guess it's like yeah it looks kind of like head on but then the camera pans back and starts kind of you realize she's laying on the hotel bed now she's she's dressed and just looking straight at the camera and then the camera does a close-up again and then pans back again with this like really loud piano music that was really weird it pans out but as it's panning out it's slowly rotating so that you 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 know she's not she's you realize she's laying on her side on the bed and it just suddenly cuts to black and movie over damn (sighs) yeah that uh that happened. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it sure did. I didn't get that she was upset. I thought that she was happy with the way that the skin had tanned. Like, Oh, you think so? Yeah, I think like she was like, ooh, ooh, it's perfect. And that's why she's like, I'm going to put this on my tit and just like squish it around. I want to keep this with me for always. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I actually, I, I did a little reading on, you know, like self-harm and self-mutilation. And I accidentally, not accidentally, but I mistakenly did a Google search for paraphilic, paraphilic self-harm, I think is what it was, which oh. maybe that's what she's doing. But, you know, a paraphilia is when you sexualize something that's not normal, like, you know, cutting yourself and you sexualize that, you know. So I guess she does kind of, but that's not really her intention. This is more just a re- kind of a standard form of self harm if you're going off of like you know psychiatry, modern psychiatry, and they basically said that there's all different reasons why people do these things. You know, some of them are pretty clear. It could be a cry for attention, or you know, um, a person who feels completely out of control in their life. So they they this is a way of taking control. Um, and it talks about all this, and then it says that you know, there's also people who do it for no apparent reason. I was like, really? Yeah. Like, no yes. reason they can't ascertain. They, you know, the person goes to therapy maybe, and they they talk to them about it, and the person has, you know, they 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 seem like they're fairly balanced. They don't seem like a highly you know anxious person or depressed or anything. They just like cutting themselves. It's like, okay. I mean, I guess if it's controlled or what. I mean, you know, tattooing is mutilation, right? Piercing. Um, but sure. Yeah. But what she's doing is, <laughs> it's. I mean, we, we all, we, you know, we yeah. all probably knew people growing up uh, that, you know, you'd see maybe like someone in school who their sleeve would pull up and you'd see like a pattern of scars across their forearm or whatever. And you knew, oh, cutter, you know, that's, that's kind of a thing, yeah. Yeah. especially in the 80s when I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's still a thing to this day. Yeah, yeah. it's it's uh, and and it's unfortunately it's you know it's a it's a way of you know that's that's what, hey, people do weird shit when they're uh, uh what what would I say emotionally hurt or yeah. psychologically damaged I mean we we have all kinds of strange ways that we cope with it I I felt like with this character with the Esther character it like I'm trying to look at it as okay is it is it meant to be art is it meant to be a commentary on her body i read some analysis that said that she basically has become completely disassociated from her body and she's trying to you know find a way to reconnect with it and you know so she's doing that and i'm like well that's possible but there, i don't know where you're there's nothing that indicates that that's necessarily what's happening i mean she clearly feels disassociated from her body in the sense where she's like at the dinner her arm she she imagines her arm has literally disconnected from her body. So it's now a foreign object. It's not part of her anymore. Um, but beyond that, I mean, you know, this movie, it could, I'm jumping around a little bit, but this, this movie fine. easily, it easily could have gotten into like, you know, the realm of exploitation. And there's going to be a lot of people who are going to say any self-harm in a film like this is, if it's not about, her getting better and going to seek treatment and all that is just exploitative. And that's because they don't understand horror films, which (laughs) this is um, a very interesting type of horror film. It's definitely a horror film, but there's easily 
you could argue that it's not a horror film. It's kind of a character study almost. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 definitely interesting. I do feel like it's a horror film. It's it's yeah. self-categorized as horror. I w- one of the key things that makes a horror film is the lack of agency on the part of the main characters. Like like the the people are suffering from things coming at them and they are powerless against it at least to mm-hmm. a point. And that's mm-hmm. not this, but it kind of is. Um like that that scene where where her arm is asleep and she's like holding it up mm-hmm. and is just like playing with it, like you you talked about the fact that you can't see Vincent behind her, like she's totally eclipsed him, and so then all of a sudden whenever he reaches up and grabs her arm and starts playing with it, that kind of has an effect on us because we we weren't thinking about him being there and she wasn't thinking about him being there and all of a sudden he's intruding into her Mm -hmm. situation so Mm -hmm. i feel like this movie to a certain extent is about bodily autonomy we've got everyone is trying to intrude into her autonomy we've got vincent is trying to intrude uh fucking what's her nuts is like taking away her her implements uh, the the people at the dinner are just making it difficult for her to to live her best life. Even her boss is like, well, yeah, that's fine, whatever, but don't let it, you know, interfere with your work. And she just wants to do this thing. So it could be something about that. It could be something about masturbation because it, it does feel very masturbatory all of the time. It also could be... Um, like I mean, uh, it's a it's a stress release for her. For oh sure. yeah, yeah. She's definitely getting some sort of chemical reaction out of it. Um, but then also it could be more of like a meta exploration of like exploitation in the film industry and stuff. Yeah. Like, because part of it is like those cameras are there, so it's mm-hmm. it's not just her having a great time by herself destroying her body in a hotel room. It's also with the cameras there, so it's like a boudoir photography type situation she wants a record of it not just <clears throat> she she at first she's happy just to have the experience but then she's looking for literally looking at ways of preserving preserving like her own flesh preserving the experience through like photographs her own flesh this is like it's taken on a, <laughs> a life of its own yeah um, it's crazy i read somewhere that at the end we're, we're looking at her and she's in an altered state of consciousness which reminded me of the film martyrs i don't agree with that i mean she's in an altered state of consciousness consciousness throughout the film and it it starts the moment she cuts her leg um the first time i watched the film i i put a lot of emphasis on that moment yeah and that i kind of like dog-eared it as the film went on and i'm like okay something almost supernatural there was some sort of transference when she cut her leg and that caused but I don't think that's necessarily the case. It's it's just the starting point. It could have been, you know, could have been anything. It's just that she happened to fall and really badly cut her leg. But, you know, it's it's interesting that she, she doesn't feel it, you know, when she does it. She's literally, like, unaware until she sees the blood on the floor in the bathroom. Um, but, yeah, and then, but the more I watched it, the more uh, that's just, it's like a starting point. You know, she's just got to, we got to get started somewhere. So she falls at this party. Yeah. And even that, like the very first scene of the movie is her staring blankly at a computer screen and her boyfriend mm-hmm. coming up behind her and being like, wow, you're not being very productive. And yeah. and so it was like she was already distracted. She was already missing something. And that fall at the party, which I'm wondering, like, was that an accident or was that like the first iteration of her car accident where it was like a thing that she did in order to cover up for it? Like it's, it's very like we're getting it all very in the middle of things and it's, it's not explained, but it is, it is intriguing. Like it, it, it pulls, pulls me in at least like I wanted to know more and it, it doesn't satisfy that. But that scene you were talking about at the end where she's looking at the camera is what made me think maybe this is, a like meta commentary on like film or whatever because it's now her looking at us and like is that her asking us well are you happy now is this enough of me giving myself for you type of thing or does it mean something else entirely i also think 
it could be like drug addiction because a lot mm-hmm. of the her behaviors are very similar to drug addiction you know yeah. leaving in the middle of a dinner to to do a thing coming back like totally fogged out <laughs> um yeah hiding what you're doing from from your friends and family and and your co-workers coming up with excuses having all mm-hmm. of the paraphernalia going to a random hotel to like junkie out in a hallway or in a room with all of the stuff that you need for it it's 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 there's a lot of really cool interpretive possibilities with this movie it's very interesting and i i enjoy it for that well, yeah, one of the things that I think is really interesting is that it's it's not even necessarily portrayed as a bad thing. She really wants the people, at, we know this because she comes to Sandrine up front and tells her, you know, she's excited to tell her friend. She wants her friend <laughs> to be a participant in this experience, maybe like a passive one, but she wants her to know. She tells her explicitly. And... And it, she she's surprised to get that pushback. Like she, I think she like there was a part of her that thought you're my friend, you should be my friend through thick and thin. You you should be able to understand without me explaining why me cutting into my own leg is good. Yeah, this is a this is a good thing that I'm doing. Like she really believes that, <laughs> and she she has enough snap to know that other people don't approve of it. But she would have been perfectly willing to believe that they did if Sandrine showed any interest. <laughs> yeah and oh that sounds crazy let me see that could have been a totally different experience for her but you know everybody recoils and it's funny because the way the movie presents those people they're like sandrine sounds like a crazy jealous bitch and her boyfriend seems like this like overly aggressive asshole who isn't listening to her but the truth of the matter is this fucking woman is like carving into her own fucking leg just for no reason that anybody can understand what is this guy supposed to do? (laughs) It's pretty, it's pretty devastating experience for somebody who, you know, is living back on planet earth to suddenly have your partner who you thought you knew just suddenly has decided that self mutilation is perfectly fine. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, and even like Sandrine's action of taking the sharp things out of the bathroom, a perfectly acceptable thing to do. Maybe, maybe do it before your friend is in the shower and not during the middle of it, like a bitch, but you know, it's fine. Yeah. (laughs) Don't be pushy. Like, why is the door locked? Like, I don't know. Maybe she's taking a, dropping a deuce, you know, like give her, give her a break. I know it's France, but come on. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe this is a bathroom, not in Europe. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, there is a door there, so people do use it. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, um, I also really liked you were talking about the sound and yeah, the sound is critical in it. And one thing that kept happening on the screen, the sound, like with the sound inclusive was there was a lot of focus on meat on the plate. Like every time there's a meal, there's like, there's a guy, Mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's got the fork and the knife and he's like cutting the, the meat away from the bones on a chicken thigh or like there's, you know, like pork cutlets and and she's like always like oh my god that looks so good <laughs> yeah it's a, it yeah it's like this there's something that fascinates her about the the idea that you know what at what point does you know your body stop being your body like you know if i remove this piece of my body is it still a part of me or, you know, is that attachment now, now I have some sort of emotional attachment to a dead piece of skin I've cut off my body. You know, even the blood, she's fascinated with this, this, like, I've got this blood that just leaks, like, dripping it on my face and rubbing it all in my skin, like, but the funny thing is, is that they never really, she never really goes, like, completely hog wild with it. Like, you don't, you don't see, like, the knife cut across the skin and a gaping wound. And, you know, you see wounds on her and you see the knife moving her skin around in horrible ways and stuff. But she, she, at the same time, she, she utilizes a certain type of restraint, which creates this weird tension as, as a viewer, it makes it like, wow. I mean, like if she had gone full gore slicing herself, of course it would have been disgusting, but it also would have been, it kind of like would separate us. Mm-hmm. And, the, this movie plays with the fourth wall a little bit, so it's like, you know, at the end, is she looking at us? Is that a symbol for something? Is she dead? And, you know, it's just an arty shot. I mean, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, it's not 
it's not like the movie Funny Games, the the Michael Hanukkah film, where they they straight up break the fourth wall, just turn to you and just be like, "Does this make you uncomfortable?" <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Hey, don't implicate me, man. I'm not part of this. <laughs> I just wanted to watch a movie. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a, man, that movie is genius. We need to cover that one. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this movie this movie does a whole lot. Like you said, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of res- restraint there. If this was a, done in America, it would have been like, oh, yeah, let's watch her sawing through her entire arm and hear the uh, like ligament popping and and mm-hmm. cartilage being pulled away from the bone and stuff but in this one it's just it's just very subtle it is still violent but it's almost well, yeah. not violent um yeah yeah it's not it's not playing it's weird because her performance maybe is is what's shocking it's not so much i mean what she's doing is obviously shocking but it's the way she plays it. There's yeah. something alien about her where you can't, you can't connect to her emotionally at all. She's very, very cold. Like she's she's a disturbing person on screen, you know. And she's she's very much disturbing in Sea to Sea, where it's like you don't want to get anywhere near her. She just is like some gutter rat who just <laughs> happens to be a psychopath. But in this movie, she seems to be relatively well adjusted. Like when she talks to people. And her normal self, she just seems like a lady. She's just some lady talking about whatever. And then the next thing you know, she's all... <laughs> it's like, what the... Eating little pieces of skin and playing with them. <laughs> Jesus Christ, what is happening? Yeah. And and it's so understated, too. Like, like that scene where she's at the ATM and she's getting upset while playing with the skin. And we, it doesn't ever explain, Mm -hmm. explain it, but what it was is that skin was drying out and it wasn't preserved. Like she wanted it to be, it was losing its texture. And so that that's why she was crying is that this little packet of skin that she'd been wanting to stay the same forever was aging and dying away. And, and that just like, that was the, the most negative emotion that she shows in the whole thing. She's just like, oh my God. It's like, I can't, I can't mutilate myself and, and still be myself. <laughs> it's, it's fascinating. It's like, yeah, if you remove a part of your body, it's going to go weird. <laughs> yeah. And guess what? It's going to happen anyway, whether you'd want it to or not. <laughs> Uh, so I gave this movie a 3.9 out of five loathsome things. There, there are some, uh, some ways in which I feel like it's not fully horror. And there are some ways in which I would have uh, liked to have seen things go another way. So it just, it just dipped below a four for me. That said, it's great. Uh, if you have, if you are, if you're, emotional well-being is aligned in the right way this is a great yeah. watch if not definitely avoid it and and you'll, you'll be okay yeah. like no yeah, worries you don't need to see it it's not imperative to watch we obviously you know we love horror movies and we can watch some pretty rough stuff but we're not we're not bragging about it it's just we're comfortable watching that kind of stuff and, and we there's things we're not comfortable and we won't watch those movies you know Dude, man, I've been noticing the way things that are not horror movies bother me. Um, I watched, I finished watching mm-hmm. Barry. The show Barry, like the way that some people just get mm-hmm. killed and it's nothing, that to me is way more upsetting than what happens in horror movies. Because in horror movies, it's like artistically framed in this way. Whereas in other things, it, the artistic framing is, oh, it's just a people that die because of a action yeah. shot. And it's like, that's, it impacts me way more than horror movie Yeah, death. people just get shot in that world and it's just kind of move on, you know, it's weird. It's yeah. like, it would be like watching, the opposite would be like watching Saw with no deaths. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Everybody just gets, barely gets away at the, at the end. It's like, wow, this, this yeah. is, what is happening here? <laughs> Yeah, I successfully dug the key out of my eyeball and I got away. <laughs> Boar porn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, fantastic. Uh, so what about you, John, on, yeah. a, on a scale of one to five? I, I gave it a, a clean four, essentially clean four. for the exact same reasons that you did. There's there's something in this movie that, that isn't quite hitting it for me. 
that I wouldn't, I, I can't give it a five because I don't necessarily think it's like a perfect masterpiece or a perfect representation of, um, you know, what it is that she's trying to get across. Having said that, it's highly effective. I don't know exactly what it is that I feel is missing. I just know that I feel there's something missing. Um, maybe, maybe if I saw like a, a better cut, the version that I saw was pretty kind of shit. Um, yeah. The sound was outrageous. Like, the, the, the sound mix takes some getting used to. I mean, it's it's so much a part of it, but at the same time, it's it's a little bit overpowering. You know, like, sometimes you're watching something really shocking, but you're also thinking about how loud the sounds are, and that's... They don't need to be that loud. They should be loud enough to, to change the feel of the scene without you thinking about it. Like, I just found myself almost distracted by... It's like, Jesus Christ, it sounds like there's like a wooden surface above her head and somebody's pounding on it with a hammer and you're <laughs> you're trying to watch what's happening on screen and it's just too much, you know? So little things like that, I, I, I gave it a straight up four, but basically the same thing you did, so. Yeah, yeah, that's a 7.9 out of 10. That's that's solid in the recommend with the, with the uh, you <laughs> know, of honest. course. Yeah, <laughs> of if, if you're not in a, the right emotional frame at the moment, give give it a pass yeah and we're not you know we are douchebags but we're not that kind of douchebag that's going to be like oh what are you a pussy you can't handle it like look we get it <laughs> yeah <laughs> we have we have our limits too there's horror movies we've talked about that we won't cover because we i'm not a, i'm not opposed to those movies i just don't think that they fit our format and you know yeah. i you know like i'm not going to do cannibal holocaust because animals are intentionally killed in that movie i don't need that I just yeah. don't need it. I'm kind of Tarantino about that. It's like when you cross that line, I'm out. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, that one's rough. I've seen it. I don't. I don't want to watch it again. I mean, you know, I say that. You know, we saw Wake and Fright, and I know that there's. You could use that whole argument that, well, I mean, they were going to do it anyway, and it's like, yeah, they weren't going to do it with fucking movie cameras rolling. You know? Yeah, like, yeah. There's that's a you know that scene. You you could have. You know, like they had a rape in the movie. We didn't have to watch Donald Pleasance's penis go up the guy's ass for us to know what happened. <laughs> you know, like we don't need to see animals being slaughtered that are doing no harm. I understand the, the concept of culling and, you know, you know, it actually is better for the species. But, you know, tell that to the guy that's being sacrificed for the species, like <laughs> for, for our entertainment. It's like, I don't know how I feel about that. Well, actually, I do. I feel very uncomfortable. I, I sad. I sad. <laughs> I sad. <laughs> so yeah, I mean that's uh, it's a good movie. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, what what about what else? Have you been watching anything else? Having having good horror movie and horror movie adjacent experiences? Not not really. I mean, I'm I'm still chewing on some of the same books that I've been reading. Um, and haven't finished anything particular. I, I finished some books, but they weren't horror related. And uh, I watched a bunch of movies and stuff. We got like a cheap run at that movie sh channel. Oh yeah, it was like five bucks a month for three months or something. So I wa I've been watching a bunch of arty films, and you know they don't really they don't really fit in in this context. Uh, so you know nothing nothing really exciting to talk about in 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 here. But how about you? Uh, I watched uh, season one of the X Files. Mm, it's nice. So fucking good. Nice. Uh, I'd seen many of the episodes before, mm -hmm. but I've never actually like sat down and watched the right. X Files all the way through. Me too. And and season one is just bangers all the is way it? through. Wow. Yeah. Every once in a while, you're gonna get one that's bad, but there there's one where it's like a whole. Um, uh, fucking uh, the thing, like John Carpenter mm -hmm. style, the thing episode. There's another one with the guy from um, uh, The Exorcist Three, mm -hmm. who is basically just doing the same thing, but from another per like another character, but the same like activity. Um, and and just all the way through, it's really good. It's also weird because this is the first time that I've watched it uh, from the age that I'm at now, mm -hmm. where. Because every time before, I was like, oh, yeah, that's Gillian Anderson. And now I'm watching it, and I'm like, oh, look, it's little baby Gillian Anderson. Look at her stupid little face. She's so young. <laughs> She's a little kid. She just kid. Aw, look, she got the little baby fat on there. She's so cute. Getting older sucks. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, man. But yeah, yeah. I highly recommend season one of The X Files. The, I guess the one thing I, that I saw that I have to recommend, it's not even horror, but it was just so damn good. You've got to go see Sisu, S I S U, which is a Finnish film about a guy who basically takes his revenge on a group of Nazis who are leaving Finland at the end of the war and decide to stick around and fuck with this guy and they pay the ultimate price for it. It is uh, amazing. It's so violent and ridiculously over the top. It's fantastic. Oh, that looks really good. Um, It's so good. Wow. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to watch that. That looks great. Yeah. (laughs) It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I have a I have a negative uh, uh, review to provide. Um, if you are familiar with a chain restaurant called the Juicy Crab, uh, don't eat there. It's terrible. <laughs> it's I've never even heard it's a chain. It's a chain, uh, and uh, we went to one. The the we got the calamari. The calamari came out looking like onion rings, like just enormous gigantic calamari rings and there was just no flavor a horrible horrible texture all of the fried food just was flavorless and bland and uh it's a it's called the juicy crab they specialize in crab and uh they brought the crab out with um a bib and a bucket and a plastic fork Mm-hmm. And a plastic spoon, and that's it. <laughs> to eat crab. <laughs> to eat crab. And so we asked, uh, do you have crab crackers? They're like, no. And we're like, uh. They're like, well, we've got um, we've got some scissors. Would you like some scissors? And we're like, yeah, sure, thank you. And then they brought out these scissors. Now, if anyone not familiar, are you, if, are you familiar with the place Harbor Freight? Yes. All right, so these are some Harbor Freight-ass looking scissors where the handle is covered in that same plastic coating that you put like to wrap wires, and it just yeah. says Made in Taiwan. And then it's, kid you not, horror movie rusty scissor blades. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> it looks like a nightmare, and they're like, here you go. Open your crab up with these scissors. So f- f- fuck the juicy crab. Wow. Have you tried the tetanus crab platter? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, crab's so juicy, you'll get lockjaw. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is really fucked up. <laughs> yeah, so. I like the, I, this is a new thing that you're introducing for the show, which I'm totally on board for. Negative restaurant reviews. Yeah! <laughs> Let's but slam them. <laughs> the, the, last, the last episode, it, was, it wasn't negative. It was actually pretty positive, but two guys, one pit. Two guys, one pit. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. I would definitely eat there before ever going to the Juicy Crab. Yeah, the Juicy Crab could suck it. <laughs> yeah, fuck off, Juicy Crab. You suck. Jesus, that's horrible. It was really bad. I think the store had just opened. The waitress was not really a uh, waitress. She she did an okay job, but you could tell that she's never been a waitress before. Mm. And... Um, uh, she was also, it would seem, the only person working there. <laughs> so Great. I think what happened is someone thought, hey, running a restaurant would be cool. And that was the amount of thought that they put into it. <laughs> I like juicy crab. Ooh, juicy crab. <laughs> what could you possibly need as far as accoutrement is concerned? A picnic fork. <laughs> <laughs> the fuck? Americans love bibs when they eat crab. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Anything? Any? Any negative restaurant reviews from you, <laughs> sir? No. 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 Un- well, I was gonna say, unfortunately. Fortunately, I don't have any negative restaurant reviews. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, we'll we'll let you all get back to your busy day. Join us in two weeks. When we cover Joe D'Amato's 1979 in Italian absurdity called Buio Omega or something like that, but more Americanly known as Beyond the Darkness, starring Kieran Cantor, Cinzia Monreale, and Franca Stolpi. Hey! It's a, hey! It's a Franca Stolpi! Oh, we're going just a little bit further away from France! <laughs> This is our jaunt across Europe. Jaundice. 
Yeah, it's a uh, it's absurd. There's plenty to be upset about in this movie too but no, i don't think there's much in, i don't remember there being any self-harm but there could have been let me see if uh if what was that fucking movie with him and his aunt uh uh william asher's butcher baker nightmare maker. oh oh yeah if that movie upset you uh then this one might also upset you it's kind of in that vein nice. but completely italian completely absurdist and kind of brilliant in all of the worst ways if only susan tyrell was in it oh that would be good <laughs> all right y'all enjoy horror movies and all of the other things happy pride month to yes. everyone happy i pride. hope you're safe and uh don't forget to punch a nazi don't forget to punch a nazi wear dresses in public and uh go to drag shows and uh i'm not sorry that uh, greg abbott has to die one day Oh, that's good. <laughs>